All right. So um, real quick, uh, you know, if you're looking for an opportunity to be able to advance your career and, um, you know, impress your workers and uh, your bosses, uh, track two. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is going to be BARF. Uh, it's a um, it's an acronym that I developed years ago. But uh, before we get into that, I'm going to discuss who I am, what BARFing is, uh, when and where you can use it, uh, why it's useful, and how do I BARF. So uh, real quick disclaimer, um, I, I was very excited to be able to be presenting at SANS today. And uh, I got so excited that I probably created twice as many slides as I should have. So uh, I may have to skip over some of the examples that I've provided, but uh, we'll see how time is working. So uh, a little bit about me. My name is Jesse Hutchinson. I work for a company called Paraton. Uh, I've been in cybersecurity for a little over a decade. I've got four SAN certs, um, acquired a couple of other certs along the way, and I've been doing proactive threat hunting for network forensics for a little over four years. Uh, my hobbies, uh, recently got back into working out. Um, you can't tell by, you know, judging a book by its cover. I, I like me some hard rock and um, I genuinely love studying for new certifications. Um, so much so that my wife has to put me on an annual restriction on how much studying I can do. So, all right. So let's get into it. So what is barfing? So it's a method that I use to be able to provide relevant updates for a variety of different documents. Uh, it's an acronym that stands for background actions taken, results of actions, and then the follow-up. So what it isn't is a rigid process. Um, it, it's fairly fluid, and it's also not easily forgotten. So uh, once you learn this acronym, you retain it for quite a while, which makes it a very effective acronym in an in environment, regardless of the name. So... Uh, where and when you might want to barf. Uh, status updates, case notes, executive summaries, incident reports. Uh, yeah, a couple of jokes here about my, uh, my unique sense of humor. But honestly, it's anytime you want to be able to send some information um, and give details from one place to another. So uh, it's a very effective method and you'll hopefully see what I'm talking about here in just a moment. So uh, talking about status updates, um, Things that you want to consider when you're giving a status update is who is requesting that update. Usually their supervisor level individuals might be the client. Uh, you also want to make sure that if you have specific SLAs that you have to meet in your updates, you want to be able to meet them. So um, barfing is really more of a, a strategy for how to collect the information and present it. But um, you want to make sure that you don't violate any of the processes and procedures that you have in place. So also make sure that you know who needs to be included in those updates. So um, yeah, if it has to be a variety of different stakeholders. You want to define that uh, early on whenever you have to give them. So all right, how does barfing fit into it? Uh, as I stated earlier, it's a versatile method that um, it captures specific data points of uh, information that you may need to pass on to somebody else. And uh, while a lot of investigations or uh, incidents might be unique, the information that most of the stakeholders are looking for is gonna be fairly consistent across the board. So um, also uh, another benefit of it, it, it's not overwhelming for the reader. It's short, it's concise, uh, and it's easy to digest, which also makes it not too overwhelming for the writer. So once you get used to the method, it is, pretty efficient in terms of how you can go about collecting that information during your process. So, all right, uh, you can also use it in case notes. And um, in this case, I'm, I'm specifically talking about like ticket updates. Um, so things that I consider make a good case note, uh, they're gonna be the details uh, first and foremost. So you wanna make sure that you include times and dates. Um, you wanna make sure that they're informative, but not too informative. and um, they should allow somebody to be able to reconstruct the things that you've done. So uh, maybe not in a single case note, but across multiple case notes, somebody should be able to follow your analytical process across um, to the conclusion. So, uh, and also uh, show progress. So uh, one of the things that I've identified throughout my career is that when you start seeing some redundant case notes, uh, that usually means that an analyst has hit a wall and they don't really know which direction to go in. Uh, that's a good indicator for management or supervisors or senior analysts to go in and say, hey, what can I help you with? You know, what are you what are you looking to try to get done here? 
So um, why they're important? Well, they kind of show your work. Um, it's uh, really useful whenever you have to explain what you've been doing all day. Um, they also keep an inventory of relevant data. So you can use your case notes to be able to, to build out your reports uh, later on. And having good quality information in those case notes is going to be helpful when you are creating those reports. So. Uh, uh, and they also will help people maintain an awareness of your investigation and understand the tempo um, of how you're working and things like that. So uh, you can use them in executive summaries um, and things to consider when you are writing an executive summary. Obviously, the audience is the most important here. So uh, executive summaries are geared towards management teams, um, C-suite personnel. Uh, these are individuals who are relatively short on time for the most part, and they normally have stacks and stacks of reports that they have to go through. So you want to be able to provide an executive summary that's going to be really quick and easy to digest by that person. And um, when they read your executive summary, they should be able to make a decision on whether or not they want to continue reading the rest of the report. Uh, but they should get the gist of everything that is included in that report in a paragraph or two. So, um, yeah, in case you haven't heard of the term bluff before, um, bluff is an acronym for bottom line up front. And this, in at least most of the environments I've worked in, this is what the executives are really looking for. They want to have a very short message telling them everything that they need to know about the analysis that was performed, the incident that took place, uh, things like that. So, uh, they tend to appreciate that bluff and the barfing method fits directly into that kind of a format where you collect the information that's going to be relevant for that individual to be able to read and they can basically make their assessment of uh, the entire document based on that simple barf note. All right. And then incident reports. So uh, generally when I look at my incident report template, um, it, it follows a, a barf format and um, Ultimately, what you're trying to do in an incident report is you're trying to show the analysis from start to finish. So um, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, I kind of created a, a plot line for um, how I go through my incident reports. And I stole this idea from Chris Sanders. But uh, ultimately, you know, you want to have a background, you uh, have actions and results, which consists of the analysis and then the follow up, which would be like the after actions recommendations so um and drafting it out like a barf is is pretty good for being able to keep that tempo so uh now when you need to prepare to barf uh you want to make sure that you have somewhat of a strategy in place in order for you to be able to go through that process so uh, it doesn't have to be a, a massive plan that um you, you've drafted out but ultimately you want to have a, a idea of what you need to put into your notes uh, or your documents. And then you wanna reference your playbooks and your policies and make sure that you have uh, the relevant information. Now, depending on the environment that you're in, it may depend on what people consider is relevant, but primarily what I recommend for relevance is gonna be the who, what, when, where, why, and how. So if you can capture those details uh, inside of your notes, that's going to end up showing relevance. So you also want to make sure that you review all of that before you disseminate it, because uh, you want to get rid of anything that might not necessarily be relevant. Um, this also might depend on your environment, but uh, best practice is just try to keep it simple. So, um, all right, so examples of what might be relevant information. So. Uh, host information like IPs, host names, um, the status of the system, threat information, malware names if you have them, um, exploits that were used, uh, threat indicators that were used to be able to come to your conclusion, um, detection method. So was it an IDS? Was it a third party notification that something might be happening? And of course, stop timestamps. So you always want to be able to uh, create a timeline in your investigations and be able to show uh, the sequence of events as they occur. So irrelevant information, uh, it might be PHI, SPI, things like that. Um, also, one of the things that I've seen throughout my career is periodically I'll see information that's included inside of a note that 
isn't really relevant to the case. Um, it might be opinions or it might be uh, offhanded statements. You want to ensure that you don't create a historical document that has information in there that makes any, anybody uncomfortable. So um, again, you know, maybe get a peer review before you, you publish anything if, you, if there's something that might be questionable. All right. And uh, also, you want to remember the intent of the task. So ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to effectively and efficiently communicate details to an audience. Uh, we want to communicate what's been done and what happened when we did it, and then also uh, what else we need to do. So um, this methodology will actually follow that kind of a path. And uh, yeah, you'll see in just a moment when I can get to some of the uh, examples. So. What's the content of a BARF? Um, again, it's gonna be a background actions, results, and follow-up. So let's break those down individually. Uh, background provides context. So uh, it gives the reader some perspective of the uh, incident or, or the case that you were working. And it also uh, adds details concerning the drivers for the task. So um, this is gonna be you know, what prompted an action and what caused you to actually take action in the first place. So uh, also, uh, the background I've seen over the years is uh, something that tends to be overlooked, uh, and it almost seems redundant when somebody continuously adds a ticket update and gives a little bit of background, but uh, it definitely helps more than it hurts because you don't know if somebody is going to be looking at your case note for the first time, and that's going to be the only one that they're looking at. It's good to be able to mention to them that the analysis that's being performed is based off of, you know, the third party intelligence or, or a malware attack. And it might help cue that individual in on uh, you know, some more information that they were already aware of, but maybe didn't know from your notes. So um, what our goal here is, uh, of course, again, is to effectively and efficiently communicate. And so we want to make sure that that reader does have that perspective and we want to make sure that we communicate it. and. Uh, in a way that they can uh, they can understand. And then efficient doesn't always mean short. So uh, you want it to be as short as possible without leaving out any uh, relevant details. So um, yeah, add, adding information in there that is going to get to the desired goal as quickly as possible. It's an important part of efficiency. All right, actions taken. So uh, why it's important, well, it demonstrates what's been done to address an issue. And um, it also helps the, under, uh, the audience understand the methodology that's being used in your investigation. So um, as you're going through it, you're, you're kind of defining exactly what steps you're taking in order to come to a conclusion. And uh, our goal here is basically, uh, again, you wanna show people that you're doing stuff. Uh, you wanna be able to track crack, uh, progress and maintain accountability of the analysis that's going on. Um, what else it does here is it'll help build confidence. So within your peers and your and your uh, stakeholders, uh, it demonstrates your capabilities, it reinforces existing processes, and uh, it can be leveraged to demonstrate ROI. So uh, ROI is one of those factors that is uh, challenging at times to be able to prove. And um, this is one way that you can go ahead and do that. So. So the results of the actions that you are taking, um, this is where you provide your impact statement and it can be positive or negative. Um, either way, it's gonna add value. Um, that's gonna be how you define what kind of a stance the organization has to take in response to the incident that you're investigating. Um, it also shows the effectiveness of those uh, actions and uh, it can help promote a, a good process improvement plan. Um, so uh, you wanna make sure that you provide those facts to the stakeholders uh, you, and it can also generate strategic intelligence. So uh, strategic intelligence is what uh, the, the bean counters basically use in order for them to be able to support uh, upgraded equipment or software, um, hiring practices, things like that. So um, strategic intelligence is also a very key component to some of the stuff that we do here. So. Uh, and again, you know, it can um, it can communicate the severity of an event, and uh, analysis always brings evidence. So uh, make sure that you include those results and the follow up actions. So 
this is a component that uh, I think is definitely critical whenever you're doing an investigation. It shows that you have a plan of action and that you're going to be following um, a, a course of action to be able to reach your conclusion over a period of time. So uh, it's great that we're doing things and it's great that we're getting results, but what are we going to be doing next? And that's a, that's a key component for management to look at. It also bolsters continuity in operations. So uh, let's say that you have to get taken off of a case for some reason, providing a follow-up uh, in your case notes or in a report can help somebody else pick up where you left off. And um, so uh, this also helps uh, to do the process improvement development. So uh, when you are creating your follow-up plans and, and things along those lines, you uh, these can also be recommendations at the close of an incident. So uh, putting a follow-up in there stating that, you know, we need to improve logging in this environment or, uh, you know, we need to upgrade our, our equipment, um, that'll help with that process improvement plan as well. All right, so examples. All right, so I created a scenario, um, kind of wrote my own little story about uh, a incident that might be managed in a SOC. And the company that I created was Dark Helmet Financial Network. So we couldn't possibly have a talk on BARF without having a reference to Spaceballs. So we've got a SOC analyst named Joe Mama. Angie Daddy is uh, the domain admin. Uh, Jim Shu is a network admin. We've got Eileen Dover and Ben Dover is her cousin. Um, Eileen Dover is a SOC manager and uh, Ben Dover is the uh, CISO. And we've got a system by the name of Deadbeat, which is a Denver office uh, Active Directory server. It's a domain controller. And of course, this incident is happening at 2.30 PM on a Friday because that's the only time security incidents actually happen. So cancel your weekend, you're staying here. Um, all right, so the issue that I created is uh, Angie sends a ticket to the SOC after realizing that Deadbeat was not reporting logs to the SIM and it's not accessible using RDP. So uh, scene one, what happens is Eileen gets the ticket and she reviews it and then she assigns it to Joe. And uh, because it is a domain controller that's, being, uh, potential, that's been potentially compromised, um, that policy requires that the CISO is, is notified within 15 minutes. And in response to that, he is requesting a status update every hour starting immediately. And Ultimately, Joe just got this ticket, so uh, he's going to be performing his cursory analysis. He's just getting into it, but what he wants to do is he wants to search the SIM logs to see if he can't identify the timeline of when the, the server stopped reporting to the SIM, and then he is going to start reviewing all of the events leading up to that situation in order for him to try to identify what the problem is. So. On his first update, which Eileen has requested, um, Joe provides an update of incident open for AD server under review. Now, um, yeah, so some people might consider this to be a good update. Uh, I've seen updates like this in the past, and this is usually what generates a hallway conversation with your management. And uh, ultimately those are, are tend to be uncomfortable for at least one person in that conversation. So uh, what do we see that's missing here? So first off, we don't have any POCs or hosts being identified. So there's no who, we don't have a what. Um, all it's saying is that there was an incident for an AD server, but nothing else is really defined here. Uh, no timeline of activity, even though Joe has been reviewing that and possibly even identified it. And then, um, the host location. So if you have a multi-site enterprise, uh, host location is important because then leadership can get on the phone with the people who need to be involved, possibly calling in resources to be able to help resolve an incident. So uh, why is this incident important? Well, anything that's involving an AD server um, tends to raise some eyebrows in uh, most situations. And uh, I included the how here. However, it, this early in an investigation, you probably wouldn't have a how. So, um, but it's something to bear in mind is, you know, how did this happen uh, is something that you should be constantly thinking about during a investigation. All right. So what a BARF update might look like in this situation. Um, 
this would be a note that I might add if I was running this, this analysis. So uh, I would include a date and a time uh, where we receive the information and then identify the POCs where we have the domain admin and then their contact information. Um, and I basically give a rundown of the incident, including the ticket and um, you know the, the actions that were taken. So currently the SOC analyst performed a search for logs generated by the subject server to identify the last date the server reported logs to the SIM. Um, and then we found a date where that occurred and it looks like it happened the day before at about 9.30 p.m. UTC. Um, I can provide an action statement uh, for follow-up activity. So uh, we have not identified a root cause at this time. However, we're gonna continue to be reviewing the information. And the next step is Joe's gonna contact the event reporter to collect additional details on this situation. So how can we break this down uh, into that bar format? So we've got a background where the ticket was open, right? And uh, it's explaining what the ticket is referring to. Uh, we have actions taken, which is we started uh, performing a, a search in the SIM to try to identify when the issue started. And then we have results. So we did find a timeline of when that incident occurred. Then the follow-up actions, uh, further analysis is going to be needed to determine root cause. And then we are also going to be reaching out to the domain admin. So i um, not sure how I'm doing on time here. Uh, I might be able to get through one more example and then still get to the content that I was looking at. So, um, all right. So uh, in the next scenario, uh, Joe's working the ticket and he reaches out to the domain admin and um, he starts to review the IPS alerts and then uh, look for any of the other logs that might be relevant to his investigation. And he has, uh, let's see. Uh, looked at the network monitor, health monitoring tool, and he's pinged the host and uh, done some various other tasks. So um, after the conversation with Eileen, uh, Joe decided he's going to try to follow that bar format. And as you can see here, he breaks it down into the different sections. However, he doesn't quite get it right. So um, the background that he provides is the AD server is not reporting to the SIM and denying access. He called the domain admin. He said that the result is the system is online and working and further review is needed. All right, so how could this be better? First off, the background is a little bit vague and uh, uh, kind of misleading. Um, he should have been able to define the actual event a little bit more accurately than stating that it, the, the AD server is denying access. Is that denying access to the user? Is that denying access to you know, any other resources? Um, the action, this is something that he did do but it's not the most relevant thing that he's done. He did some additional analysis and, and review and the results is uh, he listed that the system is online and working. Well, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the action that Joe took. So um, this could be misleading in terms of he called the domain admin and maybe the domain admin said the system is online and working. And that's not something that you wanna have your management report up if uh, it's not completely true. So. Um, and then the follow-up, uh, he says that more review is needed. Okay, but that's not really a plan. So how can we barf on this one? All right, so um, basically stating the time frame of when the events are occurring, SOC called the domain admin for additional details regarding the AD server as uh, not sending logs to the SIM, refusing RDP access. The admin noticed the issue while collecting data for weekly reports, and the admin indicated that they were last able to log in on March 2nd. Um, no users have reported authentication errors in the, the Denver subnet, and the SOC confirmed no IPS events or suspicious logins to the server prior to the issue. Uh, the server shows that it's online in the health monitor and responds to ping. Uh, can be accessed using AD Explorer. So we, our analyst used AD Explorer to be able to connect to it and review the system itself. And the SOC is reviewing recent tickets in the Denver subnet to see if maintenance occurred uh, around the time of the event. All right, so here we can break down that BARF note. Uh, we can see that a background has been provided um, and all of these slides are gonna be available for download in the future. So um, I think about a week from the end of the 
the um, summit. But if you want to go through the rest of my examples and so forth, I, I'm going to tidy this up here real quick. But um, we do define an action. We define the results of that action. And we also have a follow up plan of things that we're going to look at to progress the investigation. So um, I am going to skip over. Let's see. All right. And I'm, uh, I'm going to skip over the bluff example as, as well. Um, I did want to show how a uh, incident report or a technical document can be uh, formatted using the BARF method, though. So as you can see, uh, in my incident reports, I tend to have a summary, uh, an analysis section, a conclusion, and recommendations. So each of those particular sections can get broken down into a BARF translation for the background, actions, results, and follow-up. Um, so once you get used to this method for noting, you can also use it for your reporting and uh, a variety of other documentation. Um, additional resources. Um, Applied Network Defense in, has a course called the Effective Information Security Writing Course. So uh, it does give you six months of on-demand access for that course. Uh, it is a great course. I took it myself. Uh, it was actually given to me as an anniversary gift. Um, as I stated, you know, my wife knows that you know, I love studying for things. And uh, so she actually broke her own rule of one thing per year. Uh, and gave that to me a couple of years ago. SANS also has the SEC 402, which is the cybersecurity writing hack the reader. It's on my to-do list. Um, it is also on demand. It's a two-day course, so you don't get the, uh, the, the cool gadgets with it, but uh, you do get awesome content like you always do in any of your SANS courses. Um, and then also, of course, there's any other books on writing. So um, you can go to your public library. A lot of organizations that you work for might have a online library that you can uh, grab that uh, volumes for. And I recommend anybody who's in this industry, make sure that they brush up on their skills periodically. So uh, no matter how good of a writer you are, uh, you, you definitely wanna make sure that you keep that skill honed uh, in the future because it is essential for you to be able to be successful. So, all right, that is the end of my talk. So I can open it up for questions.